Adam Driscoll is here uh, as our president is away today. Uh, Adam is the director of admissions. He also served for, what, five years at First Baptist in Moose Jaw. Yep. And uh, you, most of you wouldn't know this, was a, a two-term student body government president. So Adam, welcome. Uh, please share with us. Thanks, Dan. Good morning. It's, uh, <clears throat> so I don't need to die. I don't need to Good morning. How are you doing? That's good. It is uh, such a joy for me uh, to be on this platform with you this morning. And I just want to lead out with a question. How many of you, by raise of hands, uh, wish that you could know just a little bit more clearly what God is asking of you in your life? By raise of hands. Okay, very carefully, I want you to uh, just keep them up, keep them up. I want somebody to keep your hands up if you want to know a little bit more clearly what God wants of you in your life today. Okay, I want somebody from this section right here. Anybody, first person down to the stage, this is your book right here. No, 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 you, no, 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 get back, get back, get back. I want right, right there, I want to make it awkward, somebody in the middle who has to climb over somebody. All right. <laughs> Okay, raise your hands. Right, right here with the pink scarf, right there. Here you go. This is for you. Come on up. Right, no, back, hand, no, okay, yep, yeah, that, right on. Okay, here we go. Now, hold on, I gotta ask a really important question. Who got the book over here? Do you have a Bible? Okay, read that first. Okay. And then don't do this instead of your homework, okay? You can't go to class and tell your professor that I was trying to figure out God's call for my life instead of my paper last night. <laughs> I remember being where you are. I remember literally sleeping on my side in my dorm, thinking about life and opportunities and girlfriend and Wishing that when I rolled over up on my ceiling, God would write what he wanted me to do. Has anybody ever had that feeling? We just say to God, God, would you just tell me what you want me to do? Just write it on the wall. Write it on the ceiling. We have such a longing in our hearts in our person, in our created being, to understand and gain clarity about what it is that God is asking of us. That's such a deep and profound question that we're actually willing to give other people the power to answer that question for us. So far in these chapels, our president has walked us through what it means to get healthy, for what it means to get strong. Well, this morning's challenge for us is as Christians, as leaders, we need to get clear. We got to get clear about what it is that God has called you and created you for. I believe that as Christians, as leaders, and tragically as Christian leaders, we fall into three pitfalls or traps. The first is that we have this fog that surrounds us. And I, I don't know how many of you have experienced thick fog. I grew up on the Atlantic side of this country in Newfoundland where the Atlantic Ocean goes right in front of my house and there was this fog. And I'm ta talking about the prairie fog here. No offense, I love Saskatchewan. But this is like I can still see lines on the road when there's fog here. I'm talking about a thick fog that's so thick you can't see across the street that you couldn't see the hand in front of your face. And, and I wonder how many of us, and, and by way of hand raising this morning, actually experience that kind of fog in our lives. It, it's actually remarkable. Just even last week, I was sitting with some youth leaders and youth workers, and, and this is their job. Like, their job is to coach and, and counsel and advise other people on what it is that God is asking them to do, and I'm sitting in a hotel conference room with them and, and asking them those very questions. So, so you, you know, like youth leadership, youth ministry, that's where you want to be? Well, I don't know. Like, how, how, do you, how do you not know? 
It, it, it's a, it's a, a tremendous challenge for us to think about what it is that God has called us to do. And again, we are so willing and wanting to answer that question that we're willing to give that power to other people. We're willing to follow, as the cliche might go, other people's script for our lives because we're so desperate for that security. When you're in a fog, you don't know where to go. You're, there's uncertainty. And, and so what happens is you're, you're not really sure which step that you want to take or, or how fast you want to go. And so as you come across opportunities or the Spirit is leading in your life, there's an element where you and I as Christians are paralyzed because we don't know how certain the step is ahead of us. Or we don't have that freedom to go and to run in the promises and the freedom of God's call for our lives. That's why I had Dan read to us Psalm 139 because it says right there. And I'm just crazy enough this morning to invite us to, to believe it to the core that when God says every day of our lives was written in a book before any one of them came to be, that he actually meant it. That he got you out of bed today for a purpose. Not just for your 8.30 class. <laughs> My mentor would challenge me on that for two years. Adam, why did you get out of bed today? Why did you get out of bed? How many of you could put that into a sentence? The reason I got out of bed today is... And when we get that kind of clarity around God's call and God's purpose and plans for our lives, we experience freedom and we experience focus. And the same would be true in any kind of leadership setting. When you get clear about the expectations that are had of you, when you get clear about the mandates that you've been given, whether it's in the church, whether it's in ministry, whether it's in a job setting or a team environment, when you get clear, you are free from distraction and you're able to focus, to say, there is a lot of good things in this world that I could do, but these are the things that I believe God has called me for. And so let me ask you this question. If you had unlimited resources, unlimited, and you couldn't fail, what would you do? Another way that I like to ask that question is simply to ask if you could do anything else, if you could do anything in your life and get paid for it, what, what, what would you do? If you knew that you couldn't fail, if you believed that this is what God was calling you to do today, what would you do if failure wasn't an option? As you begin to unpack that, as you begin to dive into that, you'll begin to get just a little bit more clarity on what it is I believe God is calling you to do in your life. Zig Ziglar, a great motivational speaker, would say to us that we don't wake up to an alarm clock. We don't wake up to an alarm clock. We wake up to an opportunity clock. Because every day, Every day is an opportunity for you and I to live out God's plan and purposes for our lives. But we've got to be clear. We've got to seek his word and his face and his will for our lives. And yes, we need to listen to the people around us, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But we can't be too quick to give other people power. Whether it's our parents or our friends or our pastors, all in good intention... But it is because of that security that we go to other people and say, just, just tell me what to do. As opposed to you and I taking full responsibility of what it means to get clear on God's call for our lives and to live that out. If I was, again, if I was thinking about this from the enemy's perspective, how, how more effective could I be as the enemy to distract the church of Christ in the world so as to keep them confused as to keep them in a fog where they don't understand what their purpose and call is. 
We all know that we've been called to follow Jesus. Those were beautiful songs, and thank you, team, for leading us to that place where we recognize that we've been forgiven, that we've been made whole, that we've been brought to this place of reconciliation with Jesus. But now what? Now what? Where do we go from here? It says in Ephesians chapter 2 that you and I are God's workmanship, his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works that were prepared in advance before the foundation of the earth. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And as we think about what it is for you and I to be effective disciples and effective influencers in the kingdom of God. Yes, it's about bringing wholeness and peace and reconciliation, but it's also about bringing purpose and focus and freedom to the people in our world that are lost and confused. And so I invite you to take seriously some of those questions If you could do anything and get paid for it, what would you do? If you could not fail, if you tapped into those deep parts of your inner person and listened to the Lord, where might he be asking you to go? What might he be asking you to do? And I would just make one more challenge before I move on here is to say that so often we confuse God's plan and purpose for our lives for a dot. We think about all the world that's out there and all the opportunities and potential, and we believe that God is calling us to this particular place with this particular job, with this particular paycheck, and this particular home and address. And I want to say God's plan for your life is so much bigger than that. Yes, you might feel led to be a pastor, or you might led to be a teacher, or you might be led to be a social worker, or you might be led to be a business leader. But where and how those gifts and those passions and that purpose gets played out might be radically different than what you anticipate. And so I want you to envision that God is not calling you to a dot, but he's calling you to a field. He's calling you to a playground where he says, everything in this zone here is all yours. And you can just run and be free and not have to worry about whether or not you're lining up with my purposes for your life because you're doing the things that I've created you for. And so I want us to to get bigger in our thinking about what God's plan and purpose is for our lives. Because sometimes things just don't work out. Sometimes that church doesn't hire me. Sometimes that relationship Yeah, I don't know if you've ever tried that. I just caution you not to. Uh, You know, God probably might not tell you to go out with that person or they'll make it really clear. (laughs) But we need to think differently about how we understand God's call. And most importantly, we need to get out of that fog so that we can run with freedom and with focus. I think the second trap that we fall into as Christians and as leaders, and again, tragically, as Christian leaders, is that we are confused about the role that we play inside of the body of Christ. We are confused about the actual gifts and talents and abilities that we've been given. This is where I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, just go there really quickly with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, about spiritual gifts, brothers, I love how Paul leads us out here. I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. And if I was the enemy again, I would think, okay, if I can't distract them from the goal, from the purpose that they have as a church, as a Christian, then maybe what I can do is I can confuse them about the place that they fit inside of the body of Christ. And I can get them starting to wish that they had other gifts or trying to get them to do things that they're not actually gifted for. About spiritual gifts... I do not want you to be ignorant. How many of you, just again by show of hands, have ever taken a spiritual gifts inventory? 
How many of you, if I was to ask you in this moment, could name your spiritual gifts? Oh, that's cool. Good job, folks. I, I, I don't want to be too elementary here. But I think it's really significant that you and I acknowledge that you and I have been supernaturally gifted by the person of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. It says here, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Let me read to you just another quote, and again, just thinking about this from a point of saying, how can I keep you from being ineffective? How can I keep, sorry, how can I keep you from being effective? How can I keep you from being from making the contribution that you've been gifted for and created for. This author says, we deny our talents and abilities because to acknowledge or to confess them would commit us to use them. We deny our talents and abilities because to acknowledge or to confess them would commit us to use them. And I think about Role confusion. I was a Clipper basketball player my very first year here as an athlete and as a student. And I was a point guard. And we used to have to do these drills where I'd have to go down and work in the post. And it was hard work. <laughs> like trying to rebound and box out a gentleman that was 6'5 and twice my size and twice my strength was incredibly difficult work. It was not the place that I was created and gifted to serve. And I think as you and I think about what it means to get involved in the body of Christ, to serve in the kingdom of God, to serve in ministry settings, wherever it is, is that we need to get clear about the contributions that God has designed and supernaturally gifted us for. But in order for us to know those, we need to know them. We need to become aware of them. And so I would encourage you, don't don't use a spiritual gifts inventory to put yourself in a box. This is no way, shape, or form meant to put you in a box. This is meant to start a conversation. In fact, the best way that I've ever used a spiritual gifts inventory is I've gotten my wife and a really close friend of mine, a person that I trust deeply, to do them for me because they can actually speak truth about how they see the Spirit of God at work in my life. And that starts this conversation about saying, huh, wow, that, that's, really, that's really interesting that you, that you see that. Because as I'll go into our next point, there are times when we deceive ourselves and we wish that we had other gifts and we lie about ourselves and to ourselves. And so role confusion becomes such a significant piece because when you're not in the right fit, when you and I aren't in the right place, that place that God has created us to be, we get really tired. We get really frustrated. It gets really hard. My mentor would often remind me, he says, burnout is not a result of working too many hours. It's a result of working too many hours outside of your area of gifting. Think about it again. There's things and work in this world that you could do and that you're so excited about that you're like, oh man, I gotta go to bed. And then you just can't wait to get back at it tomorrow. Think about those places. Reflect on them and invite the Spirit to speak truth into your life about the supernatural gifts and abilities that he's endowed to you. And the third pitfall, the third challenge that we sometimes faced as leaders, as Christians, and again, as Christian leaders, is that we deceive ourselves. We fall into deception. Thinking that we're better or worse than we actually are. One more passage of scripture for you this morning from Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15 says, the way of a fool seems right to him, but a wise man listens to advice. 
The way of a fool seems right to him, but a wise man listens to advice. One of my favorite quotes, again from another book, says this. Because you and I are on the wrong side of our eyeballs, we don't know what's working and what's not working. Because you and I are on the wrong side of our eyeballs, we don't know what's working and what's not working. And so we need to be relentless about asking brothers and sisters around us for help. We need to be relentless. Wheaties. Anybody ever remember what Wheaties was? Wheaties is the breakfast of? Champions. Wrong! Ken Blanchard says feedback is the breakfast of champions. Feedback is the breakfast of champions. And here's why it's so important, because when we get feedback, two things happen. We either get feedback and say, yeah, that's me. Like, you know, I'm a B student. Yeah, you know, I'm always going to struggle in that space in my life. And I actually have a fixed mindset, it's called, where I'm just, I, I, the reason I don't ask for feedback, in fact, because it simply validates things I already believe about myself. But here's the other option, that I can have a growth mindset where I can enter into conversations and say, listen, my goal today is to actually be a little bit better than I was yesterday. God, my goal for me and you today is to do life just a little bit better today than I did yesterday. And so we go back to Psalm 139 where it says, search me, O God. Test me. The prayer of examine, uh, Richard Foster in his book Prayer explains this a little bit. He says, uh, we give God, therefore, not just our strengths, but also our weaknesses, not just our giftedness, but also our brokenness, our duplicity, our lust, our narcissism, our sloth, are all laid on the altar of sacrifice. A yes to life means an honest recognition of our own evil, but it also is a yes to God who is in the midst of our evil, sustains us, and draws us into his righteousness. We need to rely fully and wholly on the person, again, of the Holy Spirit, to reflect and to invite him to speak truth into our lives. We need to get quiet and we need to find that space to reflect and we need to invite our brothers and sisters around us. We need to invite our team members. We need to invite other staff members to come and speak truth into our lives. We're, we're attracted to a lot of New, past, New, New Testament passages where it talks about gently restoring there's lots of places in the New Testament where it talks about if you see a brother or a sister in sin, this is the response. We love to read those passages with other people in mind. But what does it look like for us to have a posture that says, God, you need, you need to show me. You need to show me where I need to fix something in my life today. God, I'm not, I am a sinner, but I've also been called to a life of freedom. Yes, God, there's going to be things that I'm going to have weakness in for the rest of my life, and I admit that. There are things that I'm just simply no good at. But God, how do I grow just a little bit more to you today? How do I become just a little bit more effective today? You know, passage from Galatians, when, you know, when somebody believes that he is something when he is not, he is deceived. You and I, we need other people to speak truth into our lives. Because I don't know what's working and what's not working. We need to have that trust and that faith in the goodwill of other people. To say, hey, I need your help. Come, on, come alongside of me. Speak something into my life today. Those are the three challenges that I want to leave you with this morning and, and why it's so important for us, I think, as leaders and as Christians, and again, as Christian leaders, for us to get clear. Clear on God's call. Clear on your giftings. Clear on the contributions that you've been supernaturally equipped with. And you got to get clear on how you're actually doing 
both through listening to the Spirit and by inviting brothers and sisters around you to speak truth into your life. The challenge, of course, is that with great clarity, we all heard the phrase, with great power comes great responsibility, but with great clarity comes, with, comes great responsibility. When you get clear about God's call in your life and the contributions that you've been designed to make, we have no excuse. And so that's why it's a little bit easier for us to live in the fog, a little bit easier for us to live in confusion. Because when we get clear, we have no more excuse not to get out of bed every day and live a life that God has called you for and gifted you for to make a difference for his kingdom and in this world. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much that uh, you call us, you save us, you restore us, but then you just don't put us on the bench waiting for eternity. God, thank you that you've given each and every person in this room a task, a work that was prepared in advance for them. And I pray that today we would search your heart and get a little bit more clear about the things that you've called us to. God, thank you for your spirit. Thank you that we don't have to do this alone, but by the work of your spirit in us, you equip and empower us supernaturally for the work that you invite us to. And God, Search us. Right now in this place, here today, and as we go, help us to get really serious about looking in the mirror. Help us to listen to, from you, to you, and invite those who are close to us to come a little bit closer so that they can see flaws and help us to get a little bit more holy and ready to serve you tomorrow. Lord, we go in your grace and your goodness, recognizing that it's all you, and consider it just a tremendous privilege that you desire to use us for your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. Go to love and serve the Lord.